Throughout most history, Japan has been heavily influenced by China in terms of culture, philosophy, law, just to name a few. Well, this all changed after the Meiji Restoration when Japan came to see China as antiquated and weak against Western powers. Back in 1894, the small power of Japan faced a colossal Chinese empire in the Sino-Japanese War. Fought over the Korean Peninsula, this war would be the ultimate test between the two powers and their respective modernization projects. And trust me, it was an absolute steamroll campaign for one side of the conflict. During the 1880s, the bond between Japan and Korea's Chosun dynasty worsened as Korea leaned more and more towards its conservatism. In 1894, the pro-Japanese Korean leader Kim ok kyun who was involved with the Gaps in coup a decade previous, was assassinated in Shanghai. The aftermath was a bit of a gruesome affair, as authorities in Shanghai decided laws against extradition did not apply to corpses. His body was subsequently shipped to Korea and paraded around its provinces, serving as an example of what would happen to those that dare to support Japanese influence, just to give you an impression of the domestic hostility between the pro-Chinese and pro-Japanese camps. There even was a senior post created by the Qing in Seoul, held by General Yuan Shikai, furthering Chinese presence on the peninsula. Yuan's primary objective was to uphold China's privileged status in Korea and ensure that Japan did not gain a foothold. After all, historically speaking, Korea was China's most crucial tributary state. Throughout the 90s, Japan's influence on the peninsula became more prevalent and tensions kept rising. And then the Tonghak Peasant Revolution broke out and swept over Korea. This revolt, induced by a religious sect, directly threatened the Korean monarchy and its king Gojong. Now, Tonghak was an ultra-conservative sect that opposed anything westernized. The uprising started as such, anti-Japanese and anti-Western in its aim. But it quickly deteriorated into an all-out civil war. Several areas of Korea became rebel-controlled and the rebels advanced onto Seoul. The government of King Gojong, rather frightened, immediately requested military aid from their ally, the Qing dynasty. The Qing sent around 2,700 soldiers to the peninsula in order to protect the royal family. Ten years ago, an event very similar to this occurred on the peninsula, namely the Gaps in Ku. Both China and Japan sent troops to the Korean peninsula following this failed coup, but they eventually agreed that both countries had to withdraw all their troops. They were only allowed to send their troops to Korea if they notified the other party first. It seems like a clear agreement, right? Well, the Qing sent their troops without notifying Japan violating this Tianjin Treaty. When Japanese Prime Minister Ito Hirobumi got wind of this, he called a special meeting. There, it was decided Japan would send a much larger force, the Oshima Composite Brigade. Japan was able to mobilize and transport troops faster, rendering China's time advantage useless. Around 4,000 Japanese troops landed on the Korean coast in early June, only two days after the Qing troops landed. Skirmishes erupted around the countryside, though nothing serious yet. The Japanese troops appeared to enjoy momentum and managed to move up to Seoul, Korea's capital, quickly. And what came of the Tonghak Rebellion, the reason China and Japan sent their troops to Korea in the first place? Well, it was rather quickly suppressed by a mixture of Korean and Qing troops under Yuan Shikai's command. That wasn't the end of the fighting, though. Actually, it was just a beginning. The Japanese commander in Korea, Otori Kesuke, received explicit orders to remain in Korea for as long as possible. Li Wuchang, the prominent Chinese statesman, attempted to resolve the conflict with diplomacy, but to no avail. When the Japanese troops in Korea presented King Gojong with a list of reforms they demanded, the king instead demanded the Japanese withdrew their force from Korea altogether. It would take less than a month for the Japanese to seize King Gojong after refusing to carry out reforms multiple more times. Japanese troops captured the Korean palace in Seoul on July 21st and installed a regent loyal to their interests. Still, officially, it was only on August 1st, 1894 that Japan declared war on China. That did not mean there was an absence of skirmishes and hostility, however. Jonathan Spence writes that on the same day the pro-Japanese government was installed, July 21, Japanese ships fired on the British transport containing Qing troops to Korea. Few Qing soldiers survived and many skirmishes on land would follow before both parties officially declared war. The first sign of Japanese war would be the definitive test regarding the results of the Chinese self-strengthening movement and Japanese modernization. It makes an interesting case study for the comparative analysis between both countries, both 
embarking on their respective modernization paths. However, one would turn out to be far more superior to the other. On July 25, the Japanese in Qing fought the first naval battle of Pungdo. Under the command of Captain Togo Hayachiro, the Japanese Naniwa, a protected cruiser, sunk three ships and caused over 1,000 casualties. The number of losses had something to do with the Japanese refusal to rescue the Chinese sailors after they sank their boat. Four days later, they fought the Battle of Asan on Korean soil. It was the first overseas battle Japan fought in over 300 years. Although most Chinese soldiers managed to escape and meet up with the rest of the Chinese army at Pyongyang, Japan was once again victorious. Meanwhile, soldiers from both sides were still pouring on the peninsula. China had dispatched over 20,000 Chinese soldiers into Korea, and the Japanese under General Aritomo Yamagata had landed on Incheon with their goal to speed through the Korean land. On September 16, the two armies met at Pyongyang for the first time since the official declaration of war. The Japanese attacked Pyongyang from several directions, overrunning the Chinese defenders under General Ye Zichao. The Chinese suffered heavy losses compared to the Japanese, 500 to 7,000 casualties. Japan decisively defeated Qing forces in a series of battles around Seoul and Pyongyang. The Japanese were able to advance northward. Not much later, they again met Qing forces at the Battle of the Yalu River. Japan emerged victorious once again, now officially entering Qing territory. It had been an absolute steamroll campaign nobody had expected, with Qing forces suffering defeat after defeat. Yamagata's first army crossed the Yalu River undetected during the night, routing Chinese guards on outposts in Manchuria. While part of Yamagata's army under General Katsura Taro pursued the routed Chinese forces, the other part under General Nozu Michitsura advanced towards the city of Mukden. While Yamagata asserted his dominance in northern Korea, the Second Army Corps under Oyama Iwao landed on the Liaodong Peninsula, capturing the lost strongholds of the Chinese army and laying siege on Lushung Kao, better known as Port Arthur. Within four weeks they captured it. What followed was the infamous Port Arthur Massacre, where Japanese soldiers wreaked havoc on citizens and soldiers still residing in the port. Though challenging to estimate the number of Chinese slaughtered, it is thought these number in the thousands, if not tens of thousands. In effect, it meant that Japan had asserted its complete control over the Korean territory within two months. Japan's land forces could now enter China proper. As a historical footnote, the Manchu-led Qing dynasty, the same one now facing humiliating defeat after defeat, was established nearly two and a half centuries before by Prince Dorgon, who had entered China and captured Beijing via the exact same route. Hopefully, the irony is not lost on many. The Qing's last hope was the famed Beiyang fleet. The decade previous, they embarked on a modernization process for their naval power, investing enormous funds in it. Well, the Qing government was pestered by extreme institutional corruption as well. What transpired with the fleet makes that all too clear. Under Ito Tsukuyuki and Tsuboi Kozo, the Japanese fleet first faced the Chinese Beiyang fleet under Admiral Ding Ruchang and Liu Buchan at the Yalu River. The Beiyang fleet was in a dreadful condition due to extreme corruption among its leadership. It consisted of at least two battleships, ten cruisers and two torpedo boats, suffering losses of five protected cruisers, though no extreme fatal wounds, the fleet retreated to the heavily fortified port of Weihai Bay. There, the fleet lay dormant behind a curtain of protective mines, not participating in any battles. It ensured that Japanese gained control over the Yellow Sea and boosted the morale of Japanese troops at the home front even more. It also severely upset the balance of power in the region, in China and internationally. The poor performance of the Beiyang fleet, which was expected to be China's chip to victory, inspired a rivalry among imperialist powers competing to encroach on China's periphery. This wasn't too rare, as it is something we will see enough of in Chinese history in the years to come. The Beiyang fleet lay dormant in the port of Weihau Bay, but on land the Qing forces were beaten back by the advancing Japanese. The land forces retreated to Weihau Bay as well, but according to Jonathan Spence, surprised by the rapid advancement of the Japanese, they were outflanked by a maneuver of Japanese forces on land and by the fleet under Admiral Ito Tsukuyuki. The siege of Weihau Bay followed. The Japanese suffered minor losses, although a Japanese Major General, Odeiraya Suzumi, did die during the fighting. 
After 23 days of besiegement, the Japanese forces seized Veave, a defensive force, from the landward side. As Japanese troops entered the town of Veave, several Chinese sailors mutinied. The Chinese admiral, Ding Ru Chang, took his own life, together with his deputy, Liu Bu Chang, and the senior Qing commandants of the forts. Turning the guns on the Chinese fleet whilst penetrating the minefields with torpedo boats, the Japanese destroyed whatever was left over of the Beiyang fleet, although admittedly, this was barely anything. The Battle of Veiave was the last major battle of the war. China simply did not have a fleet anymore. They truly suffered defeat upon defeat. It was total chaos. Peace negotiations were instigated. Throughout the talks, there were several skirmishes between Japanese and Chinese troops, although none noteworthy. China, indeed, was a beaten nation. On April 17, 1895, China could do nothing but sign the peace treaty of Shimonoseki. The disgraced Prince Gong was approached by the Qing court, just as he had 35 years before after the Second Opium War, when the Summer Palace had been burned. He is noted as lamenting to a Western diplomat that he had been given the job of piecing together the cup which the present ministers had smashed to the floor. I don't think he was too wrong about that. Assisting Prince Gong was Li Hung Chang, sent as the Chinese envoy to Japan tasked with signing the treaty acknowledging the independence of Korea. Korea instantly became a de facto Japanese protectorate. Now, this treaty of Shimonoseki was absolutely disastrous for China. Interestingly, these terms would have been even worse had a Japanese assassin not shot at Li while the Chinese diplomat was negotiating the treaty in Japan. The Japanese government was embarrassed not just to China but the entire world. Aside from Korea's independence, China ceded in perpetuity the Pescadores, Taiwan, which now would remain a colony of Japan until 1945, and the Liaodong Peninsula of southern Manchuria. China had to pay an indemnity of 200 million silver tells and grant Japan commercial and industrial privileges on its territory, a right that was reserved only for European powers up until that point. It had to open four ports and allow the Japanese to manufacture locally in China. Japan suddenly gained access to an enormous market and could invest even more capital into the modernization of its industries. Due to the shift in the balance of power, Russia feared for its sphere of influence because Japan suddenly gained the Liaodong Peninsula, which harbored the very strategically located Port Arthur. Now, Russia had set its own eyes on the peninsula and it managed to get Germany and France to support its protests. Together, they managed to force the Japanese to relinquish its claim under this triple intervention that twisted Japan's arm into retroceding the Liaodong Peninsula back to China. Port Arthur would be a crucial port during the Russo-Japanese War 10 years later. But for now, it would cost China an additional 30 million silver tails. In order to pay off these debts, China had to borrow money from foreign powers against terrible rates. Russia got Russian and French banks to loan China half the amount required to pay its indemnity to Japan. A year later, in 1896, Russia managed to get a concession from the Chinese to build the Trans-Siberian Railway through Manchuria to Vladivostok, which was more efficient than building it through Russia's own territory. The fact that China allowed Russia to build a railroad through Manchuria would have far-reaching consequences, however. In the end, the Sino-Japanese War and China's humiliating defeat marked the dark conclusion of China's hopeful attempt at self-strengthening. After Russia gained permission to build their Trans-Siberian Railway across Manchuria, they negotiated a secret Russo-Chinese Treaty of Alliance, also known as the Li-Lobanov Treaty. In short, this meant both countries had to come to each other's aid in case of a Japanese aggression. One year later, Russia took it upon themselves to send a naval squadron into Port Arthur. In 1898, they received a 25-year lease for the entire Liaodong Peninsula, which would be vital during the Russo-Japanese War, only seven years away. They basically abused their newfound alliance with China. The war had exposed the Qing Dynasty's weaknesses. The fact that Russia obtained her ice-free port and managed to connect it via railway to Europe convinced the other European powers they had to act quickly to maintain their own sphere of influence. France, Britain and Germany started encroaching onto the Chinese periphery and sometimes straight up seized ports and trading posts. The practice was pretty much in line with modern imperialism common during that time. And as for domestic politics in China, the defeat was highly humiliating and caused a rift between the conservatives and progressives. There was no way around it. China, once the center of the world, was on the back foot.
In Beijing, China's brightest young scholars had gathered unanimously denouncing the Treaty of Shimonoseki and demanding a new, modernized and more robust program of economic growth and governmental reform. The defeat encouraged movements for reform and revolution. A domestic reform movement was initiated by Chinese scholars, most noteworthy Kang Yu Wei, who gained patronage of the Guangzhou Emperor. What followed were the 100 days of radical reforms. These 100 days did not end well, however. These events deserve an entire video on their own. I've created an entire separate video detailing the 100 days of reform. The video should be on an end card shortly. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there's a topic or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you already gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.